So the next slide is um, going back to the strain gauge part number and now we're going to look at the active strain gauge length. This one happens to be 250 which is the active length of the strain gauge uh, meaning in thousandths of an inch so 250 would be a quarter of an inch active length. And what I'd like to do is take a few minutes and talk about how you go about selecting the length of a strain gauge. And to do that we're going to look at an example using a beam that's been cantilevered with a weight positioned out at one end and it being fixed at the other. So if we look at the strain distribution across the length of the beam what we notice is that it starts out at zero at the load point and reaches a maximum back at the fixed end. And if you were to take a long strain gauge or a short one, either one, install it on that beam, what you would find is as long as you centered it at the same spot, effectively you should measure the same response because the gauge is truly an averaging device. The bigger they are, the more averaging, the shorter they are, the less averaging. But if the strain is uniform, or in this case linear, and you center them at the same spot, what you should find is that you measure the exact same result. Now the next slide, we're going to take the same idea being a cantilevered beam and this time we're going to put a notch in it. And that notch is going to create a stress concentration. So now we look at the strain distribution and now no longer is it uh, linear. We get close to that notch, we see that we've got a stress concentration we take our short strain gauge and it focuses the area of measurement closer to the notch and when it does that, that means that you're going to measure more of the peak strain. If you take the long gauge and center it at the same position, sure it's in the right spot, but now you're blending those high strains out with everything else that's around it and when you do that, what you would find is that you would measure a lower signal. And it could be dramatic depending on uh, what type of stress co concentration that you've really got. So like in this case, uh, what I would take from this is if you've got parts that have holes drilled in it, uh, welded junctions where you've got a weld bead, imagine something like an air compressor where you've got a bracket welded to the top of it and you're trying to measure the influence of that bracket. In general for that you want to pick a smaller size strain gauge. And what I typically suggest is start with one that's about a .062 active length. That's a sixteenth of an inch. And that's a pretty small strain gauge, but yet it's not so small that it's very difficult to handle. Now there are some applications like maybe where you're down around the, the maybe you're working on some gears and stuff and you're down in the root of one of the teeth, then yeah, maybe you need to go smaller. But for most applications, if you've got holes or welds or changes in geometry. Again, gravitate toward a sixteenth of an inch size strain gauge or at least its active length and then you can still go a little smaller if you need to or you can go a little bit bigger uh, if you need to. Now also you'll find in some materials are not isotropic and homogeneous like a chunk of aluminum or a chunk of steel. And if you start testing materials that are uh, composites, it could be um, a piece of fiberglass, it could be carbon fiber, uh, it could be concrete or asphalt. In general with those types of materials you start to lean towards a larger size strain gauge. Now this example shows it's got a, a, a photoelastic image of strain distribution in aggregate of concrete and it shows a small strain gauge and the, and the fear is that you would put a gauge right over top of a piece of aggregate and the strain would be very low but as soon as you got away from that area and now you're in the cement mixture, the strain level could be quite high. And typically, knowing that, when you start testing materials like concrete, you pick a larger size strain gauge so that you get more of an average across the entire length of both the aggregate and the cement. And what that does, it helps to make your data more repeatable from one location to the next or from one sample to the next. Uh, typically we like to use a rule of thumb of an active strain gauge that's on the order of three to five times the maximum aggregate size in the concrete. So if your concrete has a half of an inch active size aggregate, we're recommending probably a two inch long strain gauge to measure that. And we have strain gauges that go up to four inches long uh, for testing concrete. In general with composites we use the same rule of thumb of three to five and typically we're looking for three to five 
of the repetitions of the fibers that you see in the material. So if you look at it, sometimes on particular with carbon fiber, you can kind of see the weave in the material. You want to cover over three to five of those repetitions. And in general, what that means is that most often in composites testing, you're looking at an active gauge length around a quarter of an inch or a 250 size, like this example. 